happen. Thank you, Mrs. M. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad you all came to church today. The Lord's providing a beautiful sunny day. That sun is coming out there. Let's all open our songbooks, if you please, and turn to 146 in the songbook. In your hymnal, 146, A Shelter in the Time of Storm. Let's all stand together as we sing 146. Okay, is everyone standing? Let's try to get everybody standing. We'll look a little more uniform, like we're all in unity. I mean, after all, we are in church. We're supposed to be in unity towards the Lord, right? We know He knows we are in our heart, but let's uh, encourage one another. Amen? Let's all stand together. Thank you. That's great. You look swell. 146. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. <coughs> a shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes afraid. Shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us be a shelter in the time of storm. Thanks for coming. We're delighted that you're here on a day of rest, a day of worship, a day of rejoicing, singing together. And again, Brother Cody's only referring to those who feel physically able to stand. If you came in with a physical problem, we'd certainly understand if you wanted to remain seated or if you need to even be seated during the prayer, we'd certainly understand that. Otherwise, if you're in good health, we'd delight to stand with you and be in unity with you. Thanks again for coming. Let's thank God that we had the health even to get in here. Some that would like to come were not healthy enough to come, and we're thankful that we were healthy enough to get in here. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the shelter you are to us in times of storms and weariness in life. Thank you that we can be refreshed today. This is the first day of the week. We're reminding ourselves that this is the day of the week that you resurrected from the dead to give us hope and life and, and victory over sin and death that so many do not have. And we pray today that our worship would be pleasing to you, that you'd get honor and glory to yourself, and that we would be motivated and excited about the opportunity we have to face another week with you as our Savior and our Lord to direct and guide us even this hour, we pray. May your will be done in each of our hearts. In Jesus' name, we ask it. Amen. Amen. Shake somebody's hand, welcome somebody, two or three people, and then we'll continue. Here comes Jimmy. Yes. Hey, somebody. You got a first time visitor here. Yes.
Amen. The Lord is good. Let's turn our songbooks once again. Turn the hymnal to 97, song 97, song called I Need Thee Every Hour. How true that is, amen. 97 in the songbook, 97. We'll be seated for this one. <clears throat> I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. Tender voice like mine can be peace of I need thee, oh I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh bless me now my Savior. I come to chapter 10 Romans chapter 10 we want to read this chapter together responsively brother Baxter will lead us it's Romans chapter 10 we're emphasizing verse 17 we're studying the book of Hebrews chapter 11 the chapter of faith if you don't have a Bible we have some extra ones in the back we'd like you to see these verses think about them where does faith come from we're studying something that is not in material non-physical something that is of the spirit nature and Romans chapter 10 verse 17 is the key verse here in this chapter I think if you want your faith to grow then you've come to the right place to hear the Word of God to read it and to hear it Romans chapter 10 we'll stand together brother Baxter will lead us as we read and then we'll pray together he'll lead us in prayer Romans chapter 10 Uh, Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and, pray, and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, 
and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all them that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, and bringeth glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our poor. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the end of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I have found of them that sought me not, I was made manifest unto them that asketh not after me. The last verse together. But to Israel he said, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I ask you that you'd, uh, that you'd bless us uh, today in church. Lord, thank you that you um, gave us another Sunday for us to, to meet together and, and open your word. Um, and learn more about you, Lord, and what you did for us. Lord, I ask you that you would increase our faith. Lord, thank you for the, uh, for the gospel and, and for bringing it to us. Lord, I ask you that you'd be with uh, Pastor as he preaches today. Lord, thank you for bringing him, him back to us safely. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Hope you all be looking forward to next Sunday. We have a special guest missionary coming that wants to start a church down in Norwich, Connecticut. He's married into the Schrock family, so that makes it interesting uh, to have relatives of our own church members here that we'll have as our guest next Sunday. I hope you'll plan to come. Don't forget to set your clocks ahead uh, Saturday night. Get to bed early. Uh, you're welcome to come late if you do forget. Uh, but just don't miss both services. Um, We'll see you Sunday night if you do. We'd be delighted to have your presence uh, next Sunday. There's a youth rally coming up here March 23rd. That's always an exciting event. We'll see the place filled. The Lord willing, we have in the past. Be praying that we have a great time of spirit revival, souls saved, and surrendered to God's will here. March the 23rd, pray for the uh, Thomas family. Offer to help them. If any way you could, please, that would be a blessing to them. It's a big event. Lots of planning go into these activities. And then, of course, remember, Easter's coming real quickly, March 31st, uh, just uh, uh, five Sundays from today. Uh, you don't want to miss inviting people to come to Easter Sunday and Palm Sunday, of course, as well. Uh, dad Marsh, this is my wife's dad, thanks everybody for their prayers and concern in getting him moved from Michigan. He's uh, doing okay in okay, if you get the, uh, the, the thought. He's moved in and we had a blessed time. The thousand mile trip went real well. We were able to go scoot right through the snowstorms and everybody arrived safely. He had his other daughter and daughter-in-law there to help unpack and, and prepare his new home there. It's in a Christian retirement center. And again, if you have relatives or anybody that is looking for a place to uh, settle down and, and have Christian fellowship, that would be one of the nicest places I could recommend uh, if you know somebody needing that kind of care. The men are coming now. Our missions goal this year was $808 a week. Uh, many times we've gone over the goal, uh, but a few times, three or four times this year, we've gone way under the goal a few times. But we're still, on average, we've met our goal. Over last week, the missions offering was only $459. So again, uh, I pray that I would have the faith to believe we can get it back up there where it belongs and that you'd be giving on a regular basis. I think it's always more of a blessing to give weekly. You've heard me say that before, everybody has. That's part of our worship, just like walking through the doors. If you could justify only giving once a month or even get paid once a month, I say it's better to estimate your 
salary give every week it gives you a reason to come to the house of the lord and it helps uh, uh, my weak faith when we go under um, the goal that we've set so pray for your pastor pray for your money uh, that you'd be able to distribute it pray for extra income i think the lord blesses us when we pray for extra income uh, as we serve the lord he'll provide uh, little blessings along the way of life for you uh, Miss Stephanie is going to be playing our great Savior as the offering plates are passed. Uh, be in prayer as you think about the words as she plays it on the piano. And don't forget again, we have a great missionary, a Jewish convert to Christ, uh, by the Sam Rotman's coming in May. You want to be looking at your calendar and planning to invite friends to hear a Jewish uh, convert to Christ be playing and testifying that Jews get converted to Christ too, uh, just as Gentiles do by faith. And so let's pray for uh, the upcoming events. Brother Joshua, lead us as we pray. Continue singing praise to the Lord. 180, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? 180, let's all stand together and we sing 180 together. <clears throat> there will never be a sweeter story story of the Savior's love divine, love that brought him from the realms of glory, just to save a sinful soul like mine. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't the 
Thank you, thank you. We're in Ephesians chapter 2 to start today. Ephesians chapter 2, we're thinking about this wonderful subject of faith. Faith, if you're saved today, the only way you can be saved is by faith. This is the most important subject in the Christian life. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so it's not only that instrument by which we get saved, it's the instrument by which we stay in the will of God and stay in that place of pleasing God, uh, living the life of faith that He wants us to live. As we said, you have to be saved by this subject of faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, some of the clearest verses concerning this subject of being saved, for by grace are you saved, for by grace it's God's mercy that saves us, it's not our effort. We are, by grace are you saved through faith, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The gift of God, verse 9 says, not of works, lest any man should boast. This separates us from all other major religions and minor religions in the world. There's only two basic religions. One, we say it's all by God's grace through faith, like the Bible says, or we have a combination of all these other works that are added to it. Sacraments, some religions call it. Uh, baptism, they call, that has to be included in here. We say, no, it's all by God's grace. It's not a works. Uh, if it were a works, we could all be boasting up in heaven. We'd have a, uh, our own uh, little choir up there. Hey, I did this, and I did that, and I'm saved by my works. No, you won't get into heaven by God. Your works, 
You'll get in by the works of Jesus Christ if you believe it by faith. You've got to receive it. You've got to trust the message that we get from the Bible. And then you, of course, want your faith to grow. You don't want to stay with the little faith it takes to get saved. You can be saved with just a little faith. You may be here today with some doubts. That's the opposite of faith. Unbelief is the opposite of faith. But if you have enough faith to believe that Jesus Christ, God's only Son, lived a perfect life, 33 years, never sinned, was nailed to a cross, three days later after being buried, he arose from the grave. More than 500 men witnessed that occasion. And then Jesus ascended up into heaven, the Bible says. And the Bible says he's coming again. The question, are you ready? Jesus is coming, ready or not. If you're ready, that means you're living by faith. If you're not ready, that means you've got something to deal with today. And so verse 10 complements verse 8 and 9 by saying we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto a good, what is it? Works. The good works follow receiving this gift of salvation, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So I hope you're walking in good works today and that you want your good works to even be better this week than they were last week. That will be a result of your faith being increased, being strengthened, encouraged. That's my goal today as your pastor and friend is to help you to have your faith grow stronger. It's essential to have faith if you want to get your prayer answered. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't even pray if you didn't believe that God would hear you. And you've got to have the faith to believe that God does hear and answer prayer. You don't think you need prayer. James chapter 1 says we do need prayer. If you can hold your finger in Hebrews 11, we'll end up back in Hebrews 11. But James 1, 5 says if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask in, of God that giveth to all men liberally, that means plentifully, and upbraideth not. God does not scold us for coming to him asking for wisdom. He wants us to do that. And if you're not totally intelligent today, you realize you lack in some wisdom that God wants to give you in answer to prayer. Be good to pray about everything and anything. Not too big, not too little. You know some con contractors have on their advertisement, no job too big or too small. Well, God says the same thing regarding our prayer. There's nothing too small to ask about. Just humble yourself and ask. The thing that hinders our praying is our pride. We think we can figure it all out. And we can, that's called reason, human reason, but that's one of the hindrances to faith. We're going to deal with that today as well. One of the big hindrances to, to faith is doubt, and the other one, of course, is reason. We think we can reason it out. So we're thinking today about how to have this kind of faith. James 1, 6 says, but let him ask in what? Faith. If you want to ask God for something, ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. You don't want to waver when you ask God in faith. You want to trust him. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea. We just sang that about the sea, about the ship without a sail. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So the opposite of faith is worry. We get down and pray about a special need we have. We get up, start chewing our fingernails and uh, getting nervous and worried, and we have contradicted our prayer. And so when we pray, we want to get rid of our worry. Why worry when you can pray? Or you can reverse that statement. Why pray when you can worry? Or why worry when you can pray? I want to encourage you today in your faith. I want to see your faith grow stronger. Not only do I, of course, but our Lord wants all of our faith to grow stronger. And a prayer life is essential for our prayer, our faith to be growing. Now, the Bible gives us levels of faith, different levels of faith. Again, we don't like to divide people up into groups, but our Lord can do that for us if we're interested. There's the no faith. You can find that in Deuteronomy chapter 32. He uses this to refer to his special children, the children of Israel. Jesus is God is prejudiced. He likes Israel more than he does Gentiles. It seems like that. Um, and that's only, it seems that way. He loves everybody equally, but he chose the nation, Abraham, to start this new nation. And he has described them in Deuteronomy 32, 20. 
as children in whom is no faith. Look at that, Deuteronomy 32, 20. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. And so today, if you come in today we'll, to worship with us and you're in this category, we'd like to get you out of that category of no faith into a little faith. You only need a little faith to be saved. But then you have to be encouraged and challenged to grow that little faith to the next level. But remember, the Lord here, and Jesus makes this statement also uh, about some people of having no faith. In chapter 3 of Hebrews, for example, we should go there just briefly. Hebrews chapter 3, the New Testament describes Israel in this same basic way of people, of children, Young Christians, young believers are still unsaved. Only God knows the difference here. But in Hebrews chapter 3, we have this description of this special people that God chose uh, to walk by faith. Picked it up there in Hebrews 3 and verse number 8. It says, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do all we err in their heart, and they have not known my way. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. There it is. The opposite of faith is unbelief. And we must guard our heart to protect us from getting into that state. The old days when people get old and lose their memory and their mind, they used to refer to that back in the country. I don't know if it ever reached the big cities or not. We're more sophisticated in the big cities, but they'd refer to that person as having a hardening of the arteries, a hardening of the arteries. Their heart was getting hard. They sometimes become very bitter. They become very angry. And sometimes they would even fight back when uh, their caretakers were trying to care for them. This was before the days of nursing homes when families took care of their elderly parents or grandparents and they reverted back to childish behavior like children that are undisciplined or untrained. And I believe this reference could apply to that as well. You can be saved and living a godly life, but if you harden your heart, you're going to be living a rebellious, disobedient life, and God can't bless you when you get into that state. I think we ought to all pray that God will give us a soft heart uh, no matter how long we live that we'd be always sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God and not harden our hearts. The children of Israel did it here, though, for 40 years. All but two, remember? Joshua, Caleb. They had the faith, the continuing faith, and the rest of them had to die after 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Take heed, verse 12 says. In other words, let's check up, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. It's, it indicates, it implies that there was a time when they had a soft heart, they had a believing heart, they got up and followed Moses out of Egypt, they crossed over the Red Sea by faith, they entered, uh, got up to the Jordan River, and they crossed over the Jordan River by faith, but now they spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And here's the key again, the reason we're meeting together publicly is to exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You want to be careful to understand sin, to recognize sin. Sin is what will take us from a position of faith back to a position of no faith, to a position of little faith, if you have faith today. You can move from one category to the other. No faith, little faith, great faith. Where are you today? How is your faith? What are you doing by faith? We already did something by faith. You either passed up the opportunity to give by faith today or you gave out of a guilty conscience of responsibility or a burden. By faith would mean you would sense that what you're putting in that plate, you're investing in eternity, that somebody, as a result of your faith, will be saved by a result of your sacrifice of financials, financials, giving that you are giving by prayerful faith that somebody else will hear and understand the gospel the bible god's plan regards faith notice the deceitfulness of sin 
Most people, if we're honest with ourselves, our heart will be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Satan doesn't come and hold up a sign and say, this is sin, help yourself. No, he deceives us by thinking that it's okay what we're doing when it could be sinful behavior, sinful thinking. Worry, for example. How many of us can justify worry? May God help us to identify worry. That's one of the major enemies of faith is worry. We'll see that here in a few minutes. Where are you today? A place of no faith? A place of little faith? God's power can be limited by our little faith. Let's look in Matthew chapter 6. This is some of the best teaching of the course of the whole Bible, the greatest sermon of all, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus here is teaching those apostles in his early ministry the subject of faith. Matthew chapter 6, pick it up with me here in verse 24. Matthew 6 and 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or money, material things, physical things. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? The answer is, the question is, are, you, are we not much better than the birds of the air? Yes or no? From God's perspective, yes. He created us with a soul that's going to live forever. My travels this week, I saw a multitude of uh, wild uh, geese and ducks that were flying uh, either north or south, but they were feasting on the fields of the Midwest. God was providing for them, and I didn't see any of them that looked a bit worried. They were just gobbling up the grain that the harvesters let fall to the ground. And none of them looked a bit overweight or underweight. God provides for the birds of the air. We are to be reminded that should encourage us that they don't have any large machines to harvest their grain, but God provides for them and he will do the same for us because we're more important to him than the birds. May God help us to appreciate that or any animal of the animal kingdom. We don't see any bears up in Alaska protesting a lack of food. Uh, they are enjoying God's provision, whether they're north, south, east, or west. The animal kingdom is well cared for by God's good care. And so he's using that as a reminder, he will do the same for us. Verse 27, like, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? You can't add an inch to your height by worrying about it or even thinking about it. Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, they, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? And here's that statement Jesus makes to his 12 apostles. Would he make it in this room today? O ye, plural, notice, of little faith. Are we worried today about something? May God help us to replace what could be worried by our faith and belief and trust in God. You say, I'm worried about the financial situation in America. Let's not worry, let's pray about the financial situation. Let's pray that we can have a balanced budget in this nation and in our own personal lives. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Jesus says, What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall you be, we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. There's the place of faith. Seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. And finally he says, there, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So today, God would encourage us to replace our worry 
with faith and move from little faith where we limit God's power of provision, His protection, His providence. May the Lord help us today to move from no faith to little faith that perhaps we could get to this place of great faith. Look with me in Luke chapter 7 and we see the compliment here of a man who exercised great faith in Luke chapter 7. Where are you today? A place of no faith, a place of little faith, or a place of great faith? Luke chapter 7. We have the story here of a centurion. This man that was a leader. Certain centurion servant, verse 2, Luke 7, 2, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. Are you ready to die is a question we need to consider. When he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. This was a man that was known for his generosity, known for his... Uh, love for the kingdom, the nation of Israel. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. This is a humble man. Faith comes to the humble. Faith comes to those who know who to ask when they need something, to pray instead of worry, to pray instead of doubt, and to seek God's help when there's something that needs to be done that only he can do. And so the centurion sends this message, uh, verse 6, And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends and him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself. Don't make the trip. Don't make the effort. I am not even worried, worthy to entertain you under my roof, verse 7. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and thy servant shall be healed. Are you struggling with something today that you could have answered by faith by asking the Lord as this centurion did? For I, am, for I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith no, not in Israel. May the Lord help us today to seek the compliment of the Lord Jesus and saying, that's a man, that's a woman of great faith. And he couldn't find someone like that even in Israel. Perhaps this centurion was a Gentile contrasted to the lack of faith in Israel. Oh, there's so many hard-hearted Gentiles and Jews in our society today. I met a Jew this week, uh, said he was born in Russia, he left there as an atheist, and he wanted to continue as an atheist. He was almost proud of it, like he was trying to convince me that I ought to be an atheist too. And may God help us. You're going to meet some people like that. They're trying to evangelize for the devil, those that aren't saved. You're, you're rejecting the God of this universe as creation, thinking that this is a world I ask him, well, where do you think this big world came from? And he's one that believes in the Big Bang Theory. There's no eternity, he kept telling me. No eternity. I got to the point I just got up and left, the dear, bro, the dear man. Almost called him my brother. And I did in the beginning say, hey, you know, we're brothers in Christ if we have him as our Savior. And that didn't impress him at all either because he rejected the Messiah. Even though many Jewish people have accepted Christ, we ought to pray for more Jewish men and women to be saved before it's everlastingly too late. But what a compliment here. I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole. H-W-H-O-L. They found the servant whole that had been sick. And so are you sick today at all? Are you praying about it? Maybe it's a change of diet that would help us to be, feel more whole. Maybe we do need to see a doctor. It wouldn't hurt to have a physical checkup, but you'd want to pray before you go. Pray while you're there. Pray when you come home. Pray for the discipline that we would know how to eat properly and correctly for God's glory. That these bodies really are just loaned to us and we have a responsibility to care for them physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. 
And I'm not too convinced or not too sure that worry is a hindrance to our physical well-being. I'm not a medical doctor, as you know, but I want to encourage you to pray instead of worrying, to live a godly life, and pray that God will uh, give us an appetite for that which is more healthful for our body's sake. We're so tempted by the advertisement of the world and by our bad habits growing up, and sometimes we uh, just think because that's what our parents ate, that's the way they ate, that that's the way we should eat. No, let's think for ourselves. Let's pray for ourselves regarding our physical well-being, that we would have enough faith to be complimented. Faith is not natural, but it is acquired. And if you want to be biblical and live a godly life, you're going to be praying this prayer. You'll turn over to Luke 17. You should be there already. Luke, the book of Luke. But Luke 17 has the key here of how to move from a position of no faith or little faith. If you'll pray this prayer, after Jesus tells them here about this possibility of, you know, being unforgiving, verse 3, take heed to yourselves. Again, there's a warning. Jesus says, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith, increase our faith. I believe this would apply to married people especially. In other words, how can anybody sin against us seven times in one day? Well, it may be at the job. Somebody would be irritating you seven times in a day. You're responsible for forgiving the person seven times a day. And in the home, your wife, your husband aggravate you, the children. We're supposed to forgive them seven times. But the question is, what do you do on number eight? Well, if you're counting, I'd suggest you start over. And consider the fact, well, maybe I miscounted, so I'll give him one more break. And then, again, pray what you do next after the eighth time if the Bible doesn't tell us. But it's more natural. It's not natural to have faith. It's natural to live by the reason, by human thinking, by worry. Jesus said, take no thought. We need a sensitivity, a new sensitivity to sin. And if our world is in horrible state, Spiritually, the question is, well, what happened? What happened to the faith of our fathers if it were stronger spiritually in days gone by? What's happened to that strong spiritual heritage that we have had as a nation and have sent missionaries all over the world? And missionaries are still willing to go. We're going to meet another family tomorrow that's willing to leave home family and come to New England, perhaps the greatest mission field in America would still be here in New England. And we are part of that great missionary call to take the gospel by faith to sinners and to the saints alike. Notice verse 6 here in this Luke 17, 6. The Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, that's supposedly one of the smallest seeds, so small I've never seen one. So if any of you have any mustard seeds at home, bring it tonight. I'd like to have my faith increased uh, so I can have faith larger than a grain of mustard seed. You might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it shall obey you. But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, shall say unto him, By and by, when he's come in from the field, go and sit down to meat? Not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. And so again, we know by faith, the one in charge has the right, the privilege of asking those who are serving him to continue that provision, that protection, that providence. It really comes from God. It doesn't come from our position in society. It doesn't come from our inheritance from our family. It comes from God. And he's promising that to us today. And the question is, are we going to accept it or are we going to allow the enemies of faith to destroy our faith by worry or by reason? You know, the apostles uh, were traveling with Jesus and he had to scold them back in Matthew 16 because they had little faith, he said, or they were thinking only about bread. Let's look at that in closing here. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 6, where Jesus is again trying to teach his disciples this subject here of how to get more faith. Matthew 16, 6, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. 
You know, all these uh, false religions surrounding us are filled with leaven. That's a type of sin, a type of unbelief that takes away from our faith if we're not careful. And here they are. They reasoned among themselves. Remember, reason is one of the enemies of faith. Doubt is an enemy of faith. Worry is an enemy of faith. And here they're reasoning among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O oh, ye of little faith, why reason among yourselves? Be careful who you talk to, because some of your best friends may reason with you to hinder your faith. Because you brought no bread, do you not yet understand? Neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000, how many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves or the 5,000, 4,000, how many baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not of you concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine. Beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Beware of the Catholic Church and the Jewish temples and the Seventh-day Adventists and the Protestants and the Pentecostalists because they have a little leaven in their doctrine that doesn't match up with the Bible. And these that are insisting we need a new Bible have a little leaven mixed into their doctrine. They get their Bible from the Catholics, for example. If you haven't picked up the latest Sword of the Lord, for example, a beautiful clear article in there of how that there's two basic manuscripts that have divided Christianity of where we translate the original language of the Bible from Greek and Hebrew into English for us. And one line comes through the Roman Catholic Church, which was persecuting and burning Christians at the stake, especially John Wycliffe, who wanted to translate the Bible into English. The Roman Catholic said, no, you won't use the Texas Receptus. We'll only give you our manuscripts, which we believe have been polluted and corrupted, and they don't even believe them themselves. They think the church has authority over the scriptures. How could we trust them to have preserved for us the, the original copies that we believe our Bible came from? Oh, may God help us to be careful that a little leaven can do a lot of damage to our faith. Just a little unbelief and just a little doubt will cause us to move ever how so slowly. But you only have to move a little bit to be off target quite a ways. A little trip from Detroit down to Tahlequah, Oklahoma. I only had to get off the route just a little bit, and I could have ended up somewhere totally different. But thank God for maps. Thank God for road signs. I made it less miles than my companions did, who was in the lead car. They were following me, but I went ahead in case I did break down. I was teasing Marilyn's sister that if I had a flat tire, I wanted her to change it. But we checked with U-Haul, and they said, no, we take care of all the flat tires. They gave us almost a brand new truck, if you can believe that. 14-footer, 1,000 miles, made it in two days with just one little stop overnight. We did it by faith. A man, 92, 93 years old, moving 1,000 miles in the middle of winter. Oh, what a blessing to see God open doors and open avenues of doubt and unbelief that we can come back and report that he went with us even as God went with Abraham from his homeland there in the Mesopotamian valley he said get up leave your family and go I'll give you a new land and he got up by faith and he moved and yes all these great men and women that are mentioned here in Hebrews chapter 11 Sarah his dear wife that had faith and conceived a child in old age. We're using these as an example to say, we are humans too, and we need our faith increased. And where does it come from? From a daily submission to the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing. So husband and wives, we should read the Bible to each other daily and often. We should have it recorded in our radio and television uh, recordings uh, that if it's not from the Bible, it's going to hinder your faith in most cases. And if it's not the program itself, it's the advertis advertisements between the program that will hinder your faith. You can get the Bible on CD. You can get DVDs, and you can get it dramatized, and you can get the old-fashioned King James Bible to 
listen to it and to hear it and have your faith increased. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. May God help us not to doubt as Peter did in Matthew chapter 14. Let's go there as you think about today. Are you prepared to, to be saved? Are you prepared to be baptized? Are you prepared to take the gospel to some lost sinner this week? There's some out there still waiting. And as I said, I had a, a beautiful time away. I got on the airplane here Monday morning, and I was trying to be helpful. A lady came in with both hands filled with packages, and she had the seat right beside me. And I said, well, I'll be a gentleman. I'll pick up that seat belt so she doesn't have to sit on it and then figure out how to get un unsitted on it. And I smiled at her, uh, trying to be friendly. Uh, and uh, about halfway through the trip, I got up my courage and offered her a gospel track. But she was quick to say, no thanks, without even a smile. And I thought to myself, that does it. I'm not going to witness anymore on this trip. <laughs> but they sent me down to Newark, New Jersey. And I got off the airplane, had two or three hours there before my connecting flight. And I tell, I tell you this story to encourage you. Because someday it does seem like nobody's interested. Especially here in New England. <laughs> especially here in greater Boston. This is the hub of intellectual pride and lack of faith. It is a blessing to get out of New England from time to time. And a blessing to be reminded why I came here. Because here I believe is the greatest need for real faith to be generated and to be growing. And so today, don't run from the opportunities, but agree we have a great opportunity here. I got off the airplane, as I said, and I looked over here at the counter, and they didn't have any customers, so I went over there to ask some questions, and I asked the dear lady, I don't want to get you in trouble. Uh, she received the track with a smile and a thank you. I don't want to get you in trouble with the boss, but if you could take three minutes, I could share with you how you could be 100% sure of going to heaven. And she said, well, sure, I'd be glad. And I said, well, you must be the boss here, right? She said, uh, yeah, no problem. Would you show me? And that happened three times in a row. And was on the third person, somebody else walked up to me and said, may I have a piece of, those a piece of paper there that you've been giving out? How often has that happened to you when you were giving out tracts that somebody would come up and say to you, may I have one of those? She didn't call it a tract. She said, may I have a piece of paper that you've been giving out? She sat down and read the whole thing. And next I said... I was able to go and show her how to be saved. Four in a row right there in that three-hour period that let me show them how to be saved. Now, again, the key is not just getting people to pray with you to get uh, another notch in our belt. We're accused of that, those of us who believe in soul winning. But if somebody is ready to sh be shown the plan, you just need to ask them and make sure you're not taking them from their responsibility of work. And once you ask that clarifying question I don't want to get you in trouble with the boss and then an airport or some bus stations there are people train stations that are bored to death they have no customers they'd be glad to talk to you about their soul if you just make the approach whether they're really interested or just bored to death we will never know but if they are interested enough to let you share with them four things you can be a first-time soul winner if you've not done that before if you've not had that privilege Anyway, I share that to say that not only those four in a row there, but I met two others at the next airport that were very open and friendly before I got picked up uh, from that airport. And so there are people out there, maybe not in New England, maybe we're finished here, I don't know. No, I'm just saying that facetiously, carelessly. There's a great need here, and there are people here in New England that need to hear the gospel so that they can have a little faith all they need to see is somebody like us with a little faith to share our little faith, and they can have a little faith, and they can go from a place of no faith to having a little faith. In fact, that's how I got into the kingdom of God. I had a friend that had enough faith to believe that if he kept telling me that I was a sinner going to go to hell, if he'd tell me that long enough that it would finally get through, and it did. And I'm thankful he didn't give up on me. And I'm thankful somebody didn't give up on you, but notice here we're in closing we have uh, this thought about Peter's faith that failed him in a time of crisis. Uh, Hebrews, uh, uh, we're in Matthew here looking at this uh, uh, last thought here before we close in prayer. Uh, we're in 
the subject of doubt. Matthew 14, 31. Matthew 14, 31. Peter's been walking on the water here. Matthew 14, 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, O thou of little faith, where do, for didst thou doubt? And so as I was saying earlier, there's a possibility of having great faith. Peter exercised great faith to step out of the boat. It doesn't say the other 11 did at all. They didn't have a little bit of faith just to step out of the boat. But Peter here must have had enough faith, stepped out of the boat, Verse 30, when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. There it is. What's the opposite of faith? Fear, doubt, worry. And beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. Now that's how you become a Christian, but this is not the context of Peter becoming a Christian. This was a, in the context that he was about to drown. He was sinking in the water that he had been walking on earlier to go to Jesus, verse 29 says. So today, how's your faith? You lost a job, went to the doctor, the report wasn't totally positive, or totally negative, I should say. You can go from a position of faith to no faith to little faith. And Jesus asks us tonight here today, wherefore didst thou doubt? What caused you to doubt, Peter? When they were come into the ship, the wind ceased, and they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. And so today we're living this miracle 2,000 years after the fact saying, how's your faith doing today? Are you growing your faith? Are you moving from a little to a better, to a stronger belief and faith structure? If so, you're going to have to be reading your Bible to do so. You're going to have to be saying, God, give me the faith to believe this book. A lot of stuff in here hard to believe. And you can't believe it humanly. You've got to get beyond that, beyond human reasoning. It's beyond asking your neighbor, your friend, somebody else, well, how do you get the faith? To, you're going to have to ask God to give you the faith, to increase the faith. And yes, we can be encouraged by each other, but we can't depend on each other. Your best friend that you've gained faith in may be going from a position of faith back to little faith to no faith. And we're all moving in one direction or the other today. We're not to static. It's not permanent. Whatever position you hold today of a little faith, some faith, great faith, or no faith. May the Lord help us to stabilize our faith and to want and desire by prayer. Lord, increase our faith that we might see a great revival come to this area where it has come in the past. The history books, apart from the Bible, tell us great faith came to this area of our nation and spread across the world, across America and around the world to our missionaries. Let's believe it can happen again. That's what faith is. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's pray and ask God to increase our faith. And if you're today, here today without faith, come and accept Christ as your Savior. The tank of water is filled to, that you can be baptized today and take that step of faith if you choose. Lord, thank you that you want to give us the gift of faith by grace to save us and then to cause us to grow our faith stronger as we pray sojourn as we move about in this world that our faith would not fail as Peter's did here on the water but that our faith would become stronger as we go through life asking you to forgive us of doubt and worry and human reasoning that we would trust the God of the Bible heads are bowed eyes are closed how many of you have faith that you're saved today by the grace of God you've accepted him as your savior you have him living in your heart would you raise a hand as a testimony of your faith in God. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Is there some today you're doubting whether you're even saved or not? If you're saved or lost, you're not sure. You'd say with a raised hand, Pastor, remember me in prayer. I'm doubting today whether I'm saved or lost. I don't know, but please pray for me. Anybody in the auditorium? Yes, God bless you. Anyone else? You're not sure you're saved and you're, so you're doubting your salvation. We want you to trust God and have a strong faith that you can be saved and know it. Someone else you're saved, but you've never been baptized. You've never shown somebody how to be saved. You've never offered anyone a gospel tract and, and said, may I share with you how to go to heaven. And you'd say, Lord, today, increase my faith there where you sit. That there are multitudes here in the area that are still lost, that need a Savior. 
and you've never surrendered to say, Lord, here am I. Send me wherever you want me to go as a missionary, as a soul winner for Jesus. Help me to be that person that has great faith instead of little or no faith. Lord, have your will in these closing moments as we search our hearts to see where we are about this important subject of faith, no faith, little faith, or great faith. In Jesus' name we ask you. Amen. Amen. 351. You turn, please, with me to 351. And let's stand together as we sing. 351. Tell it to Jesus. <clears throat> Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Do the tears flow down your cheeks unbidden? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Have you sins that to men's eyes are hidden? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus, he is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother, tell it to Jesus alone. Do you fear the gathering cause of sorrow? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Are you anxious what shall be tomorrow? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You know Tell it to Jesus alone. Are you troubled at the thought of dying? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. For Christ is coming. prove to you that last point that there are still people here in New England that are open to the gospel. Brother Cody went out Tuesday night, I understand, and he has a first time visitor here today. Won't you introduce your guest today, Brother Cody? Yes, everybody said amen. Amen. How long you been in this country? Two months from China. Yes. Yes. Is there anyone else here that speaks Chinese that could greet Choo Choo? Booty? Do you speak any Chinese? No, okay. Anybody? Anyway, welcome and thanks for coming today. You're a blessing to know that somebody from another country wanted to come to hear about Jesus. We've gone to China three times to tell people over there, and they're very eager to hear over there about our Savior. And so, folks, come by and greet Choo Choo. Uh, are you from a railroad company, or do you work for your family? Have anything to do with the trains in China? Yes. Well, it was a poor shot at making a little joke about your name. In this country, we call trains choo-choos, at least the children do. But we're glad you're here. 
Yeah. About your name. <laughs> Are there others here visiting today that we would like to introduce you? They're in the back row. God bless you, ma'am. Tell us your name if you'd like. Wonderful. Thanks for coming. Anyone else for the first time? Over here, yes. It's the second time for Jimmy and Betty has a guest here. What's his name? Wonderful. So there are people, three first-time visitors here today, to encourage us that there are people out there, especially with Easter coming. A lot of people go to church on Christmas and Easter. They're waiting for an invitation to come with you if you think to invite them and pray for them that they'd want to come. Again, thanks for the regulars that have been coming for years. May you keep coming, that your faith can grow stronger instead of weaker. Let's be dismissed in prayer. And again, thanks, Noah. Uh, has friends coming next Sunday. The missionaries. Wow. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. There's answer to prayer. That's how our faith gets stronger. Every time we hear of an answer to prayer, our faith gets encouraged. Noah, we're looking forward to meeting your family and friends next Sunday. Lead us as we dismiss, please.